you do a lot of work in the MDI uh, sphere, and we had a um, on our sort of local intranet, we had a question about building a rapport with, with clients, and especially building rapport with uh, NDIS clients with disabilities who, uh, you know, for a lot of them, they're sort of out of their comfort zone coming to a clinic. Uh, you're not in their home environment. Um, they don't know you, you don't know them. And it's quite a sort of a confronting sort of, uh, for them to see a medical professional can be quite a confronting and daunting sort of uh, prospect. So. What's your advice there in regards to ways to um, generate a good rapport with a client? My the advice which I always give is try and find out as much as possible about the client and the parent and the carer before the session so that you have already got a bit of a head start. You can kind of talk about what they're interested in straight away. But you came up with some really good sort of uh, bits of advice. So what's your sort of take on that whole process? Yeah, it- Definitely before the patient actually comes to the session, having a bit of a background, who the carer is, who the granny is, you know, who the grandpa is, who's the people in this person's life. That's a good starting point of conversations. Um, So knowing who those people are, who the carers are, you know, are you with granny for the weekend and you're with mom for the week or, you know, knowing that setup is extremely helpful. It sets up a platform for you to ask questions about that person that they love, that they care for. Or that cares for them um, and I often find if you go away from asking the physio questions and you're asking the personal human questions they tend to open up a lot more but on a practical note with when you meet someone for the first time one of the very practical things you've got a seven second window to make an impression on this person to show them that you're actually going to listen um, if you miss that window period anything you do after that they're not interested. You didn't pay them the attention in the first little bit. It's not going to work. So one of the techniques that I do is I let them come in. I go in the room first. I open the door. I let them go in. I put every piece of paper down and I sit opposite. Them. I leave the pen. I leave the paper and I just sit opposite them and I say, so tell me your story. Um, and it's a good way to put it because everyone has a story. And if you give them that platform to you know, talk about their story, it, it changes how they interact with you. And that would be for like your teenager going upwards. If you had a kid, I would ditch the chair. I would sit down on the floor, cross my legs and go lower them. As soon as you make yourself lower than the pediatric patient, they automatically will listen to you and make eye contact with you. Um, with my autistic kids, I tend to use a whisper. So if I was doing an assessment and meeting them for the first time, it would sound something like this. Tell me your story. What, do you, what can you tell me? And it would be at a very soft whisper, and it just invites their ears. Oh, he's really making time for me. Yep. And I find that it's, I call it the being human rule first. So leave physio at the door. Just yep. be human first. You can do the physio part after that, but just connect with that patient. Take a couple of moments and really just connect with them. Get down to the level. If you need to change your voice and make it soft, make it soft. If you open up a platform to talk about them, you know, great platform. Don't talk about yourself. Let them talk about themselves. That's a great entry point. And often I would find out, like if it's an autistic kid and they like a particular video game, I will talk about that video game at length. Yeah. Um, so part of it is kind of knowing what they're talking about and if you don't know it's a perfect opportunity to say oh can you tell me more about that and it really just sets the conversation they're talking about something that they love they're super confident in it they're super like you know this is something that they love they'll talk about it to the nth degree and that literally happens within the first two minutes of the meeting yeah it's it's interesting isn't it because a lot of NDIS patients I've seen in the past they they bounce around a little bit until they find someone they like to see. Um, and they, they may come in for an assessment and they may not come back. They may say, oh, I've seen three other physios and it didn't work. But as, as you say, I imagine the vast majority of physios will be, they'll be straight in with the physio questions. You know, yeah. what, what can't you do? What do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? Whereas like your approach is get to know them first. Uh, you know, you've got a bit more time with them during that NDIS assessment. 
um, you know, spend the first 20, 30 minutes just winning them over and getting to know them and then getting to know you. Because um, that's what the feedback we've had about you is that the clients, they, they love seeing you and they don't want to see another physio. So, for example, when you change locations, uh, it was a big deal because they, they didn't want to see anybody else. Uh, and that's because you've created that sort of human bond with them. Yeah. As opposed to you being their physio, they kind of probably enjoy coming to see you uh, and they like coming to see you as opposed to getting dragged to physio every week because they, they feel they have to be there. Yeah, and, and to paint the context, a lot of the MDS patients have received just exercise rehab. They, they go to the gym, you know, they cycle, or they do the reformer, or they just do exercise. But exercise is not personal. Exercise is not personal at all. Um, and I often find I get the patients that are very unwilling to actually exercise. Um, and often what you have to do with your, your treatment is be completely creative. And I'll give you an example. I've got a three-year-old kid that's um, tiptoe walking and the mom's really concerned about, you know, the tiptoes. Yep. And part of it was educating the mom that, you know, tiptoe walking is actually normal for autistic kids. They don't like the sensations of the feet, you know, the socks, the label, the shoes, the sand. So that's completely normal for them. As they get a bit more sensory kind of aware that they're a little bit more flat-footed and they can walk a little bit easier on the ground. So educated the mom to treat the kid and to teach the kids to kind of walk, you know, flat footed and see if they could walk flat footed. I did about six to seven weeks of just desensitization therapy on her feet. I exposed the feet to different textures and I gave her the opportunity to, to say, yes, I like that or no, I don't like that. And I mentioned on a previous post, if you have a little tick box system, so a little tick for yes or a little cross for no, and you give them the opportunity to choose. I like this one, I don't like this one. It already kind of directs your treatment to a bit more of a focused area. Okay, you don't like these sensations, we don't need these ones, we can focus on these ones. And it just makes them more comfortable because you've given them choice and they like it. Yeah, good. It's, it's interesting, it's a, it's a totally different approach. And uh, like you say, you, um, you need uh, some patient mileage to practice these techniques because like you say, there, the average physio may go, the same one with the calves, let's do some soft tissue work on the calves to get some length in them. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, you're, you know, you're treating one of the um, symptoms, aren't you? But you're not necessarily tackling the cause whatsoever, uh, yeah. which is the sort of sensory issue in the feet. 